So my name is uh, Peter Young. I am uh, the, uh, a member of the Committee 100, and I'm also the chair of this series of Asian American Career Sealing uh, events. I want to welcome all of you uh, to this. Uh, I'm very, very pleased uh, about uh, tonight's webcast. And uh, I think uh, it's going to be both fun, but also you know, very uh, thoughtful and, and, uh, and uh, informative. Uh, before we start, though, and before I introduce uh, uh, our uh, pa panelists, our speaker, I just want to say that this was a series that started at the beginning of this year. This is actually the, uh, the eighth uh, of uh, a series of webcasts uh, that we have done on this topic. And each one has been different in the sense that we've either had famous authors on the topic, or we've had people who keep the data, or people who are heads of nonprofits that are trying to solve this problem. Uh, we had one on uh, millennials and how they view the issue. We had one on, on, on government and on legal. So what we're trying to do is take a look at uh, this problem, which is a big problem. Uh, the data really shows that Asian Americans are seriously underrepresented in so many different professions uh, in this country. Uh, so these all take a look at from different angles in a way that we hope is helpful uh, to all, all of you. And the goal of this initiative is really to contribute to what are some already significant efforts by many organizations and individuals who've been tackling this issue for a long time. This event this evening is a very special one. I have a great privilege to uh, interview uh, David Henry Huang, who I think many of you know quite well, who is really uh, one of the pioneering Chinese American, Asian American playwrights uh, in, in the US. Uh, and I think the, uh, some of the things I just wanna mention is that he has written so many very successful and famous plays and musicals, including M Butterfly, Chinglish, Yellow Face, Kung Fu, Golden Child, The Dance and the Railroad, and FOB, and I've seen many of them as well as Broadway musicals such as Elton John and Tim Rice's Aida, and the Flower Drum Song Revival, and Disney's Tarzan. Uh, but he's a Tony Award winner. He's a three-time uh, nominee and also a three-time Obie Award winner and a three-time finalist uh, for the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, what is also not well known is he's also the most produced living American opera librettist, whose works have honored, been honored with two Grammy Awards and he co-wrote co gold, uh, gold record solo with the late pop icon Prince. And he also uh, is involved with television and worked from 2015 to 2019 as a writer consulting producer for the Golden Globe winning television, television series, The Affair. And he uh, can't stop working. So he's currently writing uh, the live action musical feature, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Uh, which is not a, uh, a Chinese American theme, by the way, uh, for Disney Studios and a, a movie to star, uh, star actress Gemma Chan. So he's really uh, consistently a distinguished and prolific uh, writer uh, for, both, uh, uh, for both theater and also uh, for uh, television. Uh, I'd like to just explain how this is going to work. Uh, I'm going to do a fireside chat with, uh, with David, and we're gonna go first through a lot of his observations over time about the issue, uh, whether it's different by roles, is it different by theater versus television, try to help you and the audience understand from his perspective and his experience uh, what this uh, problem is all about. But we'll also then shift over at the end and talk about his own personal history and some of the experiences that he had uh, that uh, I think you're going to find very interesting. Last thing I wanna say is that we will leave 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the hour for Q and A. And the way you ask a question, it's very simple. Uh, there's a chat function and just type in uh, your question and uh, we'll try to answer as many uh, as we can. Uh, the last thing I wanna mention is the next or the, the uh, the ninth uh, uh, webcast in this series will be on September 22nd, 
and it will feature Janet Yang, who is a Committee 100 member, uh, and many of you know her as a very famous producer of many films, starting with The uh, uh, Empire Under the Sun with Steven Spielberg, uh, The Joy to Love Club, etc. So uh, she's going to share her perspectives uh, from uh, the uh, movie industry, uh, which is in many ways different from theater, obviously. So uh, let's start out. And I, I guess uh, my first uh, question for you, David, is uh, how has the challenge, I mean, you've been in the industry for a while. Uh, how has that, the challenge changed over time? Uh, so first of all, thank you for having me on this um, Zoom webinar. And thanks to everybody who's tuned in tonight. Um, so when you talk about how has it changed over time, I guess it depends on what period of time we're talking about. Um, I have been in this field like a really long time. Um, my first play was produced in New York in 1980. So I've seen a fair amount of um, change happen. And if you compare where we are now to where we were in 1980, in terms of theater, in terms of television or film for that matter, um, I think we have to say that there's been substantial progress and we can talk about various ways in which the field was different um, a few decades ago. Um, and hopefully during this conversation, we'll have an opportunity to talk about why some of those changes have come about. However, if you talk about just as a snapshot of where Asian Americans are in the entertainment field, um, we're still pretty disadvantaged and the glass ceiling is still quite um, difficult to penetrate, particularly where it comes to actors and stories that are specifically Asian American. Um, yes, it's better than it used to be, but it's still far from great. Yeah. Well, certainly, even in the early years, uh, it, very often they didn't have Asian actors for Asian roles, right? Uh, right. And you did the wonderful play Kung Fu, which, uh, and it was sad that uh, Bruce Lee didn't get the lead in Kung Fu uh, when, in fact, he came up with the idea. Yeah, I mean, I think you can art, there's various ways to parse that. I mean, there's the Bruce Lee story, but where it comes to Asian actors in general, several decades ago, um, maybe there were, yes, there were definitely fewer, but there were still plenty of out there to fulfill the opportunities, the few opportunities that existed. And yet there were so many times when the industry chose to cast white actors instead of Asian actors. And I think that until really the sort of the Miss Saigon protest, which was the protest of actors against the yellow face casting of uh, Jonathan Price in the musical Miss Saigon when it first came to Broadway, um, that was sort of the first time that a yellow face protest really came into the larger American consciousness. Um, although I also got my first opportunity through a yellow, through an earlier yellow face protest, a smaller one that we can talk about later. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people wonder about is whether there's a difference in terms of this career ceiling, uh, if you talk about theater versus TV, do you think there is a difference? I think there is a difference, um, and it's an, it's new. My answer is a little nuanced because I think that TV, in particular, has changed pretty quickly in the last two or three years. Um, so, first of all, there's obviously been been this great proliferation of TV shows. Um, last I checked, there are there were well before the the pandemic shutdown, there were over. 500 scripted television shows in production for over the course of the previous year. And that's so much more, if you want to call it content or product, than there had been 
say, 10 or 15 years prior to that, and certainly a great deal more than during the broadcast TV era when there were, you know, three, four, maybe five networks. Um, so there's a lot, just a lot more shows that are out there. And at the same time, I think Hollywood began to feel three or four years ago, or maybe a little before that, that diversity, um, having a range of bodies, a range of stories uh, on the screens was not only good in terms of like social justice and equality, but it was really important for the business model. Um, there was the increasing realization that A, the international audience is a, uh, is a growing share of any TV show or movie's profit, and B, that even domestically, um, here in the United States, you have a demographic which is going to become majority uh, people of color by, you know, 2040, 2050. So if you accept the assumption that people like to see themselves on stages and screens, then um, it becomes imperative to your business model to diversify, which is why you started to see a, a wider range of uh, ethnicities and types in the Star Wars movies. It's why we have, you know, like uh, a black Ariel coming up. Um, and, you know, you see different manifestations of this in film and TV. Um, where it comes to theater, I think theater is, has felt that it's important as a political and social imperative to try to diversify. But theater has been, I would say, particularly on Broadway, it's been a little slower mm -hmm. um, because the Broadway audience tends to be older, it tends to be whiter, tends to be richer, and it has been very dominated by tourists. Um, and the tourists come to New York and they, you know, they're not, uh, th this idea that you want to see yourself on stage seems to apply less um, where it comes to Broadway musicals mm -hmm. and Broadway shows. So Broadway has attempted to diversify and the not-for-profit theater, the, you know, the regional theaters, the off-Broadway um, have certainly tried, but it's been less of a business imperative uh, mm -hmm. until very recently. Yeah. And, and, you know, with, with the Broadway shutdown recently and all the reckoning around racial justice that's been happening in this country over the past few months. Well, with all the Broadway shows shut down, there doesn't seem to be any diversity, right? Right. <laughs> Well, and do you think any part of it, but the, 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 the difference between television and theater has to do with the fact that there's advertising uh, on TV shows, and so they're trying to target certain ethnic groups? Uh, yes. Um, although the, you know, the more recent uh, business model for television hasn't been as advertising dependent. Right. Yeah. So if you think about the old days of broadcast television, it was it was basically the commercials that were paying for everything, all the content. And now, uh, you know, subsequently you had cable and then people were just paying directly to HBO or Showtime for their content. And now you have streaming, which also doesn't really have a, a commercial. So advertising has become a kind of a more uh, optional uh, model for a lot of the different platforms. Yeah, of course, we we never had the term binge watching before either. So right. I you guess- You couldn't do that. You couldn't do that exactly when you had all the commercials for Pampers and things like that. Um, you know, I think one of the things that you and I chatted about in preparing for this webcast was that it's a, it's, it's not fair just to bundle everything together because in fact, there are so many different roles within theater and television, producers, actors, writers, uh, the executive suite, uh, the creative side. So maybe share with us how you think that things might be different depending upon what role you are. Because after all, some of the people in the audience, some may be thinking about being uh, writers versus being actors and so forth. So I think those differences matter, right? Yeah. So, I mean, let's just look at 
first we'll look at executives versus creatives. Um, in terms of being an executive in an entertainment company, whether you want to sort of rise up in a network or a production company or a talent agency um, or finance um, entertainment, um, there's less of a glass ceiling in those fields. Um, and some of the basic problems that Asians or stereotypes that Asians have to overcome in executive suites applies to this industry as well. Stereotypes about, you know, whether or not we have um, administrative uh, uh, sort of executive capacity and um, authority and all those things that, you know, Asians sometimes have to overcome. But basically, if you're an Asian American, but you're not necessarily working on Asian American stories and content, then you are not restricted by um, any feeling that, well, I don't know, you know, Hollywood feeling, oh, I don't know if that story is going to sell. Even right. today, when right. there's a much wider range of, of uh, a, a much greater openness to a wider range of stories. Um, so there's, you know, the executives, and I, I've worked with a lot of executives recently, particularly over the past few years in film and television who are Asian American, who yeah. have um, high positions at major studios. Um, so the, now we, we go to the creatives. And again, it comes down to, so creatives being directors and um, designers and writers and actors. And again, it comes down to, to what extent is the work you do identifiably Asian? So right. if you're a film director and you're, you know, you're just to pick an example, um, you're James Wan and you created the Saw movies, um, that, that's not a particularly Asian story. <laughs> um, and so, I think um, we would agree. <laughs> right. So there's no, I mean, there may be some uh, subliminal uh, influence, but no, but it's obvious, it's not in an obvious sense. And so there's no real restriction in that sense. The question becomes, if you want to create Asian American stories, Asian American content, then it's always been something that's been considered risky. Um, and it's again less risky now, but it's still harder to get those sorts of stories made. Yeah. And then where it comes to actors, actors I think have in some sense the hardest time of it because there is no escaping um, the, the fact that you, you put an Asian actor into a story, it, even if they're not playing a character whose ethnicity is particularly germane to the story, um, there's the, the question of the unfair question of, oh, you know, either does it make the story too Asian or, well, he's not doing anything Asian. Why, why are we even casting him? Right, um, right. So there's that kind of catch 22. Yeah. And I guess that's was probably true for a lot of other ethnic groups too. Like, you know, those people are African American because, or, or uh, where over time, they've managed to get roles that have nothing to do with this, the color of their skin, whereas earlier on, uh, they got pigeonholed, right? So yeah. it's probably very similar. It's just we're at a different stage in that progress, right? Yeah, and, and there was a, an interview that, um, oh, how do you say it, uh, uh, John Boyega, Boyeda did mm -hmm. um, from Star Wars, just a couple of days ago, where he was talking about um, his character in the new, in the latest series of Star Wars movies, and Kelly Marie Tron's character, and the degree to which maybe the creators didn't exactly know what to do with them after a certain point, and it was harder to to come up with storylines for them and keep them active. Um, as opposed to say, you know, an, an Adam Driver or somebody. Yeah. Well, by the way, a good example of this transition is 
someone obviously you know quite well, B.D. Wong, right? Mm -hmm. Because he originally was your in M. Butterfly, and that was an Asian role. And now, then over time, and now he's in, in TV shows where he's just, it's not relevant that he's Asian for the roles he's having in, you know, in these NCI type, you know, uh, TV shows. So maybe that's a good example, right, of the transition. Yeah, so that is. I mean, the fact that you can have Asian Americans now in series where they're not, um, they're, they, their character isn't dependent on their ethnicity. Um, the next step is to be able to have Asian characters as leads in series where it's not dependent on their ethnicity. And maybe the best current example of that is Sandra Oh in Killing Eve, mm -hmm. where, you know, she's a Korean American who happens to be in England. And every now and then that comes up, but basically that's not what her story's about. Well, certainly just thinking about movies like Mulan just came out. And the first Mulan movie was directed by a Chinese director, a Chinese actress, and now the most recent one, they're all Chinese actors, but uh, but a Western director. So it's kind of interesting, right? How how those things change. Yeah, I mean, the, the original Mulan, the animated Mulan, did you mean to say? Uh, well, I meant the movie version, not the animated. The oh, animated, oh, oh, yes. The animated was, was the first one, I think, right? Yes, the animated uh, did not have, I mean, the animated also had a, had a white director. Um, but had at least one Asian American on the writing team. Right, right. Now tell me, uh, one of the things that is influencing things like movies, et cetera, but maybe not theater, and I'd like that, or TV, is catering to an Asian uh, Chinese audience, but also Chinese investors. You know, we've seen a lot of Chinese investors in US films, right? And we also increasingly because the movie audience in China is far, fairly large, but I suspect that doesn't is not much as a factor when you talk about theater, or 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 TV, or maybe it is. I don't know. I mean, it is to some extent because um, certainly where it comes to musicals, um, Broadway musicals want as much as possible to tour China as well nowadays. Right. Um, so there have been several, you know. Tours of Lion King, for instance, in um, in China, there's a Lion King. At least there was for a while at Shanghai Disney, uh, Shanghai Disneyland, um, and um, TV shows also get exported to China. Um, so the content restrictions that creators have to deal with when a product goes into China. Um, apply. So some things, sometimes things get cut. Uh, sometimes things don't get approved. Um, I personally have, I've never had a show done, well, until very recently, I'd never had a show done in China because all of my work is too controversial <laughs> to be done there. That can be done in, you know, it's been done in Taiwan and Japan and Singapore and Hong Kong and all those places, but not, um, not the PRC until Fairly recently, um, the Shanghainese writer-director uh, Lai Sheng Chuan um, yeah. took my show, The Dance in the Railroad, the re revival that we did at Signature right. Theater a few years ago, and did it at the Wu Chen Festival. Right. Uh, and then I've also, my Disney music, Aida, uh, has also toured China. But, um, so, so I'm pretty, you know, I've had kind of firsthand experience with <laughs> content restrictions uh, in China. And, um, it's it's a sensitive thing, um, and I personally feel like well. The other thing, where it comes to Asian Americans and Chinese Americans, is there's not. I found that that, that there's not necessarily an interest in um, Asian American stories in right. China. I mean, right. there you know. So um, so again, Asian American stories have the problem that in America studio executives don't necessarily fee feel there's an audience and in China there's not a built-in audience either and that's why even though we have had successful Asian American movies in the last few years I find it interesting that they tend to be about Chinese American families 
in China or Chinese American, like Crazy Rich Asians is huh. um, about the Constance Wu character is Chinese American, but she's in Singapore right. or The Farewell. I mean, these are movies that I really enjoy, so I'm not dissing them at all, but it's just interesting what takes off in the market. The Farewell similarly is about a Chinese American family who goes back to China. Um, Mulan is certainly a Chinese story. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Someone you, you and I both know, Bob Niederlander, you know, mm -hmm. he's been trying to, and, and the Niederlander family is quite famous because they, they, they own so many of the Broadway theaters and they have made a strong effort uh, to try to uh, bring uh, Broadway shows uh, to China. And he talks about the same issues you talk about. And he mm -hmm. said, I think he, he tried to, he brought the producers, right? Uh, over to China. And you know, the, that one scene with springtime for Hitler, right? Mm -hmm. apparently, apparently, you know, the Chinese didn't think that was a very appropriate scene, but so he had to go through the whole thing of what was acceptable, not only to the government, but also, uh, you know, to, to the Chinese audience, right? Yeah, and I have to say some of this is not governmental. Right. I mean, a lot of it is governmental, but some of it is just what happens when you take a show to any other country. You yeah. don't know how people are going to respond. And I've been fortunate to have a number of shows that have had international lives in Asia and in Europe. And, you know, sometimes it, uh, there are things that were hits at home that certain European audiences just didn't get. And then you have a show like, um, you know, like Disney's Tarzan, which was not particularly successful on Broadway. We ran a year, which is not great for a Disney musical. And then we rewrote it and took it to Germany and it uh, ran for a decade. So you just <laughs> never know. Uh, that I won't be able to figure out, right? <laughs> the German audience. Uh, now, there are a lot of people who are in this audience who are in the early or the middle part of their career. And they're pursuing all different parts of uh, TV and theater. And 99% of the people who signed up are Asian American, you know, for this webcast. What advice would you give to someone going into either theater or TV, you know, thinking about if you were, you know, if you were entering the professions today, what advice would you give yourself or to the people in this audience? I think it's important to realize that I don't know how to game this industry. And I don't think that that's a particularly interesting thing to do. In other words, to try to go, oh, this is what people want to see and or this is what was the hit this year. So I'm going to try to create something like that. Um, I think it's much more interesting, and this is particularly true in theater, but, but I think at the moment, true certainly in television, that what, what the market is looking for is unique voices, um, individual vision. So the thing that makes you uniquely you, the thing that makes you um, idiosyncratic and weird, that is your superpower as an artist. That if you write from that place, then you're creating the thing that only you can make. And number one, it's more, I think, satisfying as an artist. It's really exploring yourself and your circumstances and your world through your work. But ironically, it's more likely to get you attention um, and you're more likely to become successful by doing that. Um, I started writing about, you know, Chinese American stories at a time when there were very few uh, Chinese American playwrights. And I somehow thought, you know, I should be able to write about this stuff and have a career just like, you know, someone like Sam Shepard, the Pulitzer Prize winning playwright. Right. And that was, um, I guess sort of an audacious thing to think at that point, but it's ended up being true for me. Um, the thing that's different now is that there's, it's still hard, as I said before, but there's more of an opportunity than ever.
to get people interested in Chinese American, Asian American stories. And so if there's one that you really want to tell, um, this is the best time to try to try to make that happen. Yeah. You know, related to this is, of course, the problem we're going through now, which is the pandemic. And it's hit, it has hit certain industries very hard. Uh, good news is uh, you're not in the cruise line business because <laughs> that's tough. But any, so much of entertainment, which involves people being close to each other, you know, not, not TV, has been affected. But even things like film and so forth, the ability to have uh, film things obviously has been affected as well because of, uh, uh, of, of social distancing and so forth. So, you know, so many people I know who are in television or in theater, you know, essentially everything has stopped. So any perspectives, and I'm sure you know so many people have been affected, I, I, any advice you would give to people to how to deal with the current, the current pandemic and, you know, what do you have to do in order to try to overcome it or, you know, uh, in, the, in the interim when, when things have sort of frozen? Um, well, in, it's incredibly difficult for uh, people who were making their living in theater. And um, because there is no, as you say, and, we, and everybody knows, there is no production right now. Um, and therefore, you have an industry which has been decimated and a lot of people who are out of work. Um, in terms of advice, I mean, one of the things I would say is that we, there is a, a uh, campaign that started yesterday called um, hashtag be an arts hero. Mm -hmm. And it's really about recognizing that um, people who work in the arts are arts workers and that they are really suffering right now and need to be included in any governmental effort to help support people in fields that like the cruise industry um, have really taken a big hit. Um, so that's, that's an important thing. Um, in terms of individually, you know, there's so many ways that people are innovating and trying to remain creative during this period. A lot of it involves having to um, create your own material. Um, and whether you put it on Zoom now or you write or you try to create something that is, you know, can be performed outdoors. Um, it's a way to stay artistically engaged, although it may not be of much help economically. Um, economically, there's, I mean, a lot of theater artists, even in the best of times, including myself and most playwrights, uh, make our livings uh, in, in film and television. And while, as you say, production has stopped for the most part, I mean, there's some movies that are starting to crank up again uh, under uh, kind of quarantine conditions. Um, but for the most part, the work that exists right now is in animation uh, for actors. It's in animation, it's in voiceover. Um, writers fortunately can still work, so I'm lucky. Um, editors, post-production people, um, um, podcasts, um, books on tape, anything like that. Um, those are still fields that fortunately are able to employ people. Yeah. And, and I think you have to be creative because you can sometimes take a bad situation and be creative and make it a good one. I, I know some people who do immersive theater and so they, mm -hmm. instead of doing it live, they did the entire thing by Zoom and you went yeah. from one, one virtual room to another. By the way, Someone was joking the other day, said, you know, the traditional stereotype that actors uh, make a living by waiting on tables. He said, now you can't do either one. <laughs> so, <laughs> True. Now, what I'd like to do now, as we said, is let's go switch back to talking about your own personal history. And I've heard before, because I remember once being at an event where you talked about how you got into the business and so forth. And it was a great story. I mean, how it, how it happened. And it was talent, but also some luck and so forth. So 
let's start with how you got into this crazy business, because I, I know the story is very interesting. Yeah, so I, um, I got to college and I started writing plays and I wrote a play to be done in my dorm. Um, I went to Stanford and my senior year um, lived in a dorm that's now called Okada House, but at the time was called Hunipro. Hunipro. It was the Asian American themed dorm. So at Stanford back in those days, um, the dorms put plays on in the spring. And since I was in an Asian American theme house, I decided to um, finish this play that I'd started writing uh, the summer before when I got to take a playwriting workshop with Sam Shepard and another wonderful playwright, Maria Irene Furnes. And that play was called FOB. Um, so we did it in the dorm. And then 14 months later, it opened off Broadway at the public theater in New York City. It's a fantastic so, place. I, yeah, so I got it, which is an amazing <laughs> theater, which is where I still do most of my work. Um, so I, you know, got out of the starting gate sort of freakishly early. Um, and how did that happen? Um, there are two things I think that are worth noting. One was that uh, it was an intersection of art and political activism, because I was saying a little earlier um, that the Miss Saigon protest against yellow face casting was um, extremely prominent. But 10 years prior to that, the public theater and its producer, founder, Joseph Papp, who was you know, arguably the most important theatrical producer of the last half of the 20th century. He created Shakespeare in the Park. He founded the public theater. He produced innumerable things on Broadway, including A Chorus Line. Um, so Joe had produced a play in which a Caucasian actor was cast in an Asian role. And that led the Asian actors of that day, who were really relatively few in number, to do this really brave thing and protest um, outside the public theater. Um, and Joe, because he had founded a theater whose mission was to um, look like New York, Joe invited the protesters into his office and hired them one of them onto his staff with the brief to find plays for Asian actors. And it was just about that time that this script of mine, FOB, came across their desk. So I was the beneficiary of affirmative action uh, because that's what affirmative action does. It right. identifies a social need and then creates a program to deal with it. Um, Joe created this program, opened the door for a bit, and I was the person who got to walk in. And that's why I believe in affirmative action. And where it comes to show business, there, the, it continues to be really important and useful for getting um, all sorts of people of color, but especially including Asian Americans, into writers' rooms uh, on TV shows. There's something called the, the diversity hire in uh, right, a writer's right. room, which is, you know, it's, it's a kind of not a great title. But anyway, it gets people in the door and um, and we still need that um, to uh, to begin to expand our own influence. And then the other thing that happened was that we did a reading of it at the public. So Joe became aware of my script. We did a reading, which means you get a bunch of actors together. They sit in chairs. Um, they just sort of read it off of the music stand um, to to understand what the play sounds like. And then. After the reading, Joe took me into his office, and I was 21, and he was Joe Papp, you know, so I really wanted him to like me. And, and, you, were, and you were still at Stanford, or were you out of No, Stanford? by then I graduated. Yeah, so, right. Right. Um, but it was like the summer right after I graduated. Right. Um, and so Joe said, you know, I think the script is great now. And the, Joe said, um, I, I like this play, but I have some notes. And he gave me some notes. And I think it's really important to listen to notes. And I totally have um, my and entire career up to now. And important to listen to Joseph Papp, right? Right, except, <laughs> that I, except that I didn't happen to agree with his notes. Yeah. But, you know, I was like, great. Um, <laughs> and Joe said, so, you know, do another draft and send me the script and I'll decide whether I'm going to do it. 
So I went back to uh, the Bay Area where I was living at the time and I waited about three weeks and I sent him back the exact same script. And about 10 days later, the phone rings and it's Joe Papp and he says, okay, the script's great now, we're gonna do it. Um, so that was how I got my first production. <laughs> Uh, by the way, he's really a legend. And the public theater at the Astor Place, when he took over that public library and made it into a bunch of theaters, was amazing. And I think I came to New York, graduated from Yale, came to New York around the same time and saw the third show of a chorus line for $3. Wow. <laughs> original wow. cast, original cast. That's amazing. But but he took gambles on, he took, he. it takes some people who, can take a risk, right? Yeah. On new things, right? Because yeah. the idea of taking a play from a 21 year old, you know, is pretty exceptional, right? Yeah, who gets that opportunity, you know? And so it's a combination of um, the actors being, you know, doing a protest and Joe being open minded and willing to take a risk. And then he produced my next um, three plays, you know, three plays after that. And, yeah. and, I had a wonderful experience with him. Now, what, what then happened then, then between then and I think then you ended up at, you know, with, with M. Butterfly, which was extraordinarily, you know, successful. Tell the story as you progress through that period in your life. You mean post M. Butterfly? No, no, or, before, before. No, before. How, what, led, what led to M. Butterfly? So, yeah, I mean, M. Butterfly is maybe still the play for which I'm best known. And um, I had... So was, I heard the story at a cocktail party and it's the type of story you would hear at a cocktail party. Somebody said, oh, have you heard uh, about the French diplomat who had a 20 year affair with a Chinese actress who turned out to be A, a spy and B, a man. And the diplomat claimed that he never knew the true gender of his lover. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. Um, and I, thought about this story for a while. Um, and eventually, about a year later, I was driving around one day and I thought, oh, what, the, what did this diplomat think that he'd found? And the answer came to me, oh, he probably thought he'd found his version of Madame Butterfly. And at that point, the idea of um, using the spy story, but also kind of deconstructing the Orientalist stereotypes of submissive women and all that that's inherent in Puccini's opera, Madame Butterfly, um, that all felt like an interesting way to get into that story. So I, I wrote the play and uh, this kind of, this, another very brave producer, um, Broadway producer named Stuart Ostero, who at that point was best known for having produced Pippin and 1776. Um, Stuart really liked my idea and he wanted to put my show on Broadway. And I was like, wow, I'd never, <laughs> that no matter what happens, uh, it's gotta be a plus because I've never done a Broadway show. Right. Um, we took the show to Washington DC first for what's called an out of town tryout, like you do it in some other city and see what's wrong with it. And it basically got terrible reviews. So we were um, kind of hemorrhaging money um, Stuart's co-producer is a very famous producer named David Geffen. Um, yes. Oh yeah. And Geffen at that point tried to close the show down. Um, and Stuart, again, very bravely, abrogated his um, partnership agreement with Geffen, mortgaged his house to get the money to bring us from DC to New York we opened with, you know, no advanced sale. And then fortunately we got good reviews in New York generally. Yeah. Um, and the show won the Tony and then we were hit. But yeah. one of those Broadway stories is that this one happens to have a happy ending. Yeah, that's right. Well, as they say, they say the best successes are a combination of talent and luck and, yeah. and perseverance. And it sounds like you've had a big dose of both, right? Yeah, I've, I've been, you know, for anyone to have a career at all, I think in most things, but certainly in entertainment. And then for as long as I have, 
um, yeah, I think I'm good, but there has to be a big dose of luck. And then sometimes you have bad luck too. Yeah, yeah that's right. But then I think your career since, you know, over the years now, it, you've really, you really carved your own path as to what you want to do and how and different media and so forth. So tell us sort of post M Butterfly, M Butterfly and so forth. You know, what are the, the sort of the, the themes in your in your career? I guess where it comes to the plays, which are probably the, you know, the most personal things that I work on, um, starting from M Butterfly onwards, I guess I feel that there's a certain number of my shows that are more Asian American oriented and a certain number that are more internationalist. Right. Um, so M Butterfly, for instance, although I think it's a story that only an Asian American could write, or at least that my take on it, um, is none of it takes place in America. Um, it takes place in China and in France. Okay. And uh, so there's stories like that, um, a play of mine called Golden Child, which was on Broadway in the late 90s, um, Chinglish, which was uh, on Broadway in uh, 2012, um, terrific, terrific play. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> those are all, you know, kind of focused on uh, Asia. And yeah. then you have um, shows like Yellow Face um, and a lot of the earlier work as well that's more Asian, specifically Asian American. Uh, and then the newest show, um, yeah. Soft Power, yeah. which, which, um, which we did at the public well, first in LA and San Francisco, then at the public this past fall, in which um, we think is going to Broadway when Broadway comes back. Um, that is, I think, combines both of those because it's a show that is supposedly a Chinese musical um, written in China about the 2016 election. And so, uh, but it's clearly, comes out of a DHH, uh, a, an autobiographical character. Um, it's his fever dream when he gets stabbed in the neck, um, which is, which is which something was, that uh, happened to me. Which happened to you, right? Exactly. Yeah. No, I enjoyed the show and it was really, it breaks through a lot of like norms, right? And yeah, takes, it's pretty takes weird. Risk. It, take, <laughs> yeah. it takes risk, but I think like M Butterfly took risks, right? Yeah, it was yeah. not. It wasn't a safe. It wasn't a safe, uh, you know, play, right? Yeah, and I, I guess I believe in um, in taking risks, in trying new things, in uh, experimenting with the form, and that also means sometimes, by definition, if you experiment, some of those experiments aren't going to work. But right. I think failure is an important part of the process of being an artist and a human being for that matter um, also. Yeah, and it almost certainly, no matter who you are, you will experience it if you're in theater and television, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. By, def by, by definition. Well, let's see, we have a few questions here. So, oh, here's one from Grace Ding. She has a question that says, how much does representation in one arena, theater, TV, or films affect the others? Is, it, is one more impactful than the others in terms of driving change in the entertainment space? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, so clearly film and television reach larger audiences. I mean, the number of people who see um, one episode of a highly rated TV show is probably, or it's probably greater than all the people who see a hit musical on Broadway in a year. Um, so if you count it just quantitatively, then film and television is more important. However, theater has an influence that um, affects these other fields. And if you think of theater as being like the yeast that causes um, the bread to rise, I think theater influences how um, how stories can be told, um, the forms and the types of stories. And that's evidence to me now 
in the fact that playwrights, for instance, are extremely valuable in television. Because as I was saying earlier, what television is looking for now, because you have, well, had 500 shows in production, they need something that's gonna break through, something that's different, something that's gonna get press, um, that's gonna get um, talked about on social media. And a lot of those voices come from theater because theater has cultivated artists who, as I said earlier, are kind of idiosyncratic, who are individual, who are trying new things, who are weird. Um, so I, I think that in terms of the ecology of uh, these different mediums of entertainment, um, that's kind of how it works. And film right now, and Janet Yang will be able to talk about this more skillfully than, uh, than me uh, in the next webinar, but film is, you know, by and large, it tends to be more of a mass medium now and television's able to concentrate on uh, smaller niche markets. Uh, right. Whereas film, because they're so, ex because movies are so expensive and epic now, need to be something that appeals to a general audience, not just in this country, but around the world. So there's these different uh, business models and audience sizes um, for, the, for the various mediums, which is why the type of influence that they have over the culture and representation, uh, the way that lands is different. Yeah, and certainly not, it, not there is overlap between the different media, but it's different and different business model. Like you produce new plays and they go to Broadway, but they have to break through. Whereas like Disney, one of their business models is take Lion King, that was a, a play or Tarzan, and then take it to Broadway, which works for them, right? Because mm -hmm. you've already got a brand name and tourists come and so forth. So it's a totally different business model, but it addresses Grace's question, which is sometimes there are different types of intersections between the different media, right? Right. Yeah. Now there's another question here. Uh, as a creative, have you ever turned down an opportunity because of issues with Asian American representation? And how did you know that it was the right decision to walk away? Um, yeah, I've, I have turned down a lot of things. Um, I mean, there are a few, couple of things that I've accepted that I think I shouldn't have. Um, and I learned my lesson uh, thinking that I could, I mean, I'll, I can just talk about it. I mean, there was a, um, there was what we then called a mini series, I guess it's now called a limited series, um, that Hallmark did that uh, was, they asked me if I wanted to do a Monkey King for Hallmark. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting idea. Um, and that I and kind of, I, I got pitched on it pretty seductively. Uh, and I, you know, about being on set and uh, in China and uh, sailing down, you know, the Yangtze or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then just, it, it eventually became a mini series that got released. Um, it's got so many titles. What's it called now? Um, I can't remember it. And that's just as well. You shouldn't watch it. But anyway, <laughs> um, I, I learned that, oh, you have to be really careful right. about the priorities. So I've never, I, I can't think of anything where I walked away and I regretted it. There are a couple things that I said yes to and I regret it. Yeah. Here's an interesting question. Regina Kim asks, how do you think the pandemic will affect the way that scripts and screenplays will be written going forward? Do you think the writers should adapt their stories, including plot characters, et cetera, so that they're more reflective of our, of our new normal and not uh, uh, anachronistic? Yeah, I wouldn't, I'm not a big believer in, in should in general. Um, as I said earlier, I feel like I don't know how to game this thing. I don't know how to go, okay, well, if I do this, it'll make it more likely a producer, more commercial or whatever. Um, so for me, the question is, is there something that you want to create, which 
is reflective of this current moment. Presumably, this moment will pass. Um, and you know, again, I don't know how to game things, but there's a part of me that feels that when this is over, um, there is going to be this kind of explosion of entertainment because people are really going to want to uh, to experience these things. There's this repressed desire to experience things like theater and things like live entertainment, concerts, sporting events, and um, and enjoy themselves at the movies. And for me, enjoyment isn't mutually exclusive to sort of content. I think you can explore serious subjects and explore what you believe in and also make it enjoyable. Um, but it's not necessarily the case to me that they're going to want to see stories about this period um, where people are wearing masks unless there's a story that you really want to tell about this period about, about oh. people wearing masks. Yeah. Well, one thing's for sure, with all these millions of people trapped at home, believe me, there's a pent up demand for entertainment. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's no question uh, about it. So are you, do you feel, I guess, I guess you feel in your career, right, that although you've faced some difficulties, some related to your profession, some related to the fact that you're Chinese, Asian American, so that you know, there's some things that probably you were inhibited in doing and so forth. Uh, but are you hopeful that that the, you know, that that the continued progress of Asian Americans in theater and in television is going to get to some place that really feels like a good progress? I am hopeful um, because getting back to the first question, I mean, our, our, the first thing we talked about, um, I have seen so much change over the, what, 40 years that I've been doing this. And the idea that I can be working on projects right now for mainstream studios and networks that center Asian American characters and that people are excited about telling these stories, that in itself is a huge difference from even say 15 years ago, when for the most part, if you wanted to write a story about Asian Americans or Asia uh, for uh, a mass medium, you had to figure out a way to make a white guy the main character. Um, so I believe that's gonna continue. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we always promise to start on time and to end on time. And we've reached uh, the one hour uh, period. I really wanna thank uh, David Henry Wong for being our guest on this webcast. I think your observations about the career ceilings issue over time and what people have to think about, I hope, uh, very valuable to the people who are who are uh, uh, online right now. And, uh, and I want to thank the audience for some very good questions uh, that uh, that you posed. So thank all of you. And uh, I also just want to remind you that our ninth uh, uh, Committee 100 Asian American Career Ceilings event will be September 22nd, featuring Janet Yang, who many of you know quite well, but she will talk about uh, the movie industry. And then uh, we're currently working on one for mid-October, which will go back to the corporate ladder issue, and we're going to feature a CEO, a Chinese American CEO of a major public company uh, paired with a partner uh, McKinsey uh, where they've done a lot of work on how the whole corporate ladder works for Asian Americans. So perhaps maybe less interesting than theater movies, but perhaps equally valuable. So thank you all of you. And uh, uh, I uh, wish all of you uh, a good rest of the good rest of the month. Great. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for having me. Thank you, David.